Welcome to Radio Full. Um, great to have you joining us for our second ever web broadcast live from um, Whitley Paul in Oxford. We're here in the uh, acting principal's office and uh, this month I have as my guest Dr. James Robson who um, I'll introduce you to in just a moment. Um, just thought I'd give you a little bit of update on some news from Wycliffe uh, before we begin this broadcast. <clears throat> I suppose the first thing to say is that we are into the final term of the academic year with a lot of our students uh, in exams this week um, and then also many looking forward to starting uh, new work in parishes in the Church of England or other ministry both in the UK and around the world. Um, the climax of our term is the 8th of June where we have our commissioning day, send students off to their new ministries and very privileged to have Dr Ravi Zacharias as our guest preacher for that occasion which will happen at St Andrew's Church up the road in just a few weeks time. Some of you will also know that we've recently announced the appointment of a new principal. Uh, the new principal is Dr Michael Lloyd who currently is the chaplain at Queen's College here in Oxford and he is also teaching part-time at uh, St Melitis um, course in London and he'll be joining us um, probably uh, over the summer but certainly ready for the new academic year. Um, there are opportunities to meet him if you're near Oxford. He'll he'll be here on the 22nd of May for an open day um, in which he'll set out a little bit of his vision for Wycliffe chance to meet with staff and students on that day. So if you'd like more information about that, everything is on our website, um, which many of you will be logged into at the moment in order to watch this webcast, but you'll find more information there. Anyway, James, great to have you here today. Um, some people know you, but just tell us a little bit about yourself and also um, what you do here at Wycliffe. So uh, I'm tutoring Old Testament and Hebrew here. That's my main responsibility. So I teach basically all the Hebrew here at Wycliffe. Um, I also teach um, plenty of Old Testament. I've got a number of administrative responsibilities as well. I'm the course director for two courses, um, the BA and the postgraduate diploma, those are two ta courses taught in the main university, in the, um, largely in the faculty there, senior status students here, mostly for ordination training, but also for academic theology. I'm also what's called a senior tutor, which is a strange Oxford title, doesn't mean I'm the oldest. It, it means that um, it tends to be to do with academic quality and an administrative title. I sit on a committee in the university as part of that. I'm also Dean of Degrees, which means I have to dress up and uh, say Latin for graduations and I also take part in matriculations. And then I run a fellowship group and um, try and do some research and writing. And I'm also on the senior management team, so I line manage the Biblical Studies tutors. So plenty to keep you busy. Mm. And in the midst of all of that, you have recently written a book, which we'll talk about at the moment, um, yeah. Honey from the Rock. Looking forward to talking about that. But Maybe just before we get to the book, you could tell us a little bit about how you got into your area of research and particularly what was it attracted you to the Old Testament? So what took me into the Old Testament, first of all, was it was Jesus' Bible. It's also three quarters of the, or more than three quarters of the Christian Bible. Um, it seemed to me, from my experience as um, a person in the pews for many years, that um, it was a neglected part of the Bible. I noticed that the title of our session, somewhat provocatively, was how to deal with the Old Testament. My daughters uh, this morning said, Dad, can you come and deal with a spider in the bathroom? And it's that sort of, do we really have to deal with it? And that saddened me greatly. And um, the very few evangelical scholars work in the area of Old Testament, and even fewer Anglican evangelical scholars, especially in the UK. So it's my passion that the church should hear it. The New Testament, after all, doesn't confer authority onto the Old Testament. It recognises the authority the Old Testament already has. Not saying that there are no challenges to interpretation, but Jesus wasn't embarrassed by it at all. And where else would you find out about creation, a God who's made the world? Where else would you find about men and women created for a purpose? Where else would you find out about God's sovereignty over the nations, about the incomparability of God? Where else would you find them? And learn about how to respond to the suffering of God's people or social justice issues or the gift, gift of sexual love. Need I say more? Mm. Um, but 
why Deuteronomy? Was that another way? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, the Old Testament in particular. I mean, Jesus's Jesus's book that was very clear in the amount it was quoted. And I suppose, particularly with Deuteronomy as well, is it the most quoted Old Testament book uh, from the lips of Jesus? Yes, it was. I, mean, I believe so. People obviously dis dispute how you actually count them, but I've certainly read, and it makes good sense to me. It was the most quoted book that uh, Jesus had on his lips. But I got into Deuteronomy originally because I was um, heard a series of lectures on it, and then I was asked myself to give a series of lectures, and um, I found them very stimulating, and students seemed to enjoy them. And the more I got into it, I found it was so penetrating and so relevant, <laughs> and so uh, connected in lots of ways. So I ended up designing an in entire um, paper that I taught around the book of Deuteronomy. So I was ended up having class contact time of 52 hours on the book of Deuteronomy and had such a wonderful time with it, and it's been simmering for some mm -hmm. time with me. So that's really how I, got, I guess, got into it. Mm. Good, so this is the book, Honey from the Rock, um, published this year by IVP um, UK, um, Apollos, um, as well as in the United States, and um, there is uh, the retail price of 14.99. but actually if you use the special code uh, that you can find online as well, um, then you can purchase it for just 10 pounds. So James, let's talk about the book a little bit. Um, we've touched on this already, but uh, Deuteronomy, we find on the lips of Jesus, we believe quite a lot, but um, tell us some of the ways in which Jesus interact and quoted the book of Deuteronomy. Well, at one level, he sees himself as the climax of the story that Deuteronomy tells. Also, Deuteronomy perhaps more than any other book, paints a vision of a culture, of a society, almost a constitution, which tr crosses the boundaries of the religious and the political. And in the same way as Jesus, he crosses the boundaries of the religious and the political. So he, he's king, unlike Herod. And you think of the Apostle Paul later on saying that Jesus is Lord, unlike Caesar. Um, so there's a sense in which it's a blueprint for life. That, and it embodies a call to decision, most famously in the very end, choose life. And he sees himself embodied in it. I think of John's Gospel as a case in point, something like that, um, where he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And you think, well, normally love doesn't go together with obedience in quite that direct way. And then you go back to Deuteronomy and find that's exactly what you find there. Or you find... Um, Jesus as the son who's obedient in the wilderness. And then you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. All in the temptation narratives, Jesus quotes three times over from Deuteronomy. He's done what Israel didn't do. He's been faithful, or Israel were not faithful. And in a sense, I think you paint a little bit of a picture of within Deuteronomy, there's the sort of the micro story of God's big macro yeah. plan of salvation. Just unpack that a little bit for me. Yeah, so there's a sense in which um, Deuteronomy, it's the fifth book of the Bible. It's the last book of the uh, Pentateuch, or the Jewish Torah. Um, in that sense, it's a climax of um, the first five books, which have sometimes been called the Gospels of the Old Testament. That's where you see God's saving actions in the Exodus, and God's giving of the law, his revelation, and, and so on. Um, so that's a, it's the end of a certain story story in the dawn of a new one, a story of Israel's history as they prepare to enter the land. And so Deuteronomy takes its place both looking backwards towards Genesis and also looking forwards to subsequent history of Israel's life in the land, um, prospering in the land, tragic uh, falling into idolatry and uh, failing to live as God has called them to do, and then God in his grace, the other side of judgment, providing a way forwards for the people. He's going to circumcise their hearts and bring them back to the land and restore them so they're obedient. So I don't think I'd quite thought of it like that before. And so in a sense, not only is Deuteronomy part of the big salvation story, yeah. but in a sense you see it kind of as a microcosm of the whole salvation story as well. Yeah. So yeah. twice over in Deuteronomy as a whole, it tells this same story once, um, perhaps most, uh, what's the word, most, uh, distilled fashion in what's called the Song of Moses in chapter 32, which is where the title comes from, Honey from the Rock. You find these phases, these stages in Israel's life looking backwards and looking forwards. 
God's faithfulness, Israel's unfaithfulness unfolding like that. And so Deuteronomy tells this story, and it's also part of this bigger story, mm. going back to the beginning <clears> of <throat> Genesis and then on into the future. Mm. And that, that connects to me, because I like, you know, when you get drilled down into the details to then pan out the, ca the camera, as it were, and see the big story and come back in and out. And in a sense, that does that. Yeah, very much. And one of the things which I think is really important is we, we often think of the law, and you think of law, legal, dry, dusty. But actually, for um, the word law is a translation of the Hebrew word Torah, which is instruction, of which legislation is part, but it's not the only thing. It's instruction, it's teaching, it's narrative, it's history, it's everything all together. And just say that a little bit more, because people get quite right as Christians, don't they, about the place of the law um, today, and, you know, students will write tomes uh, in their essays on this particular topic, but yeah. can you help help people a little bit understand from Deuteronomy what is the place of the law for the Christian today? Uh, that is a huge question. Students write a lot, scholars write a lot. Um, I guess I'd want to say three things. The first of all, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that Christians are not under law. What's meant by that, I take it, is that the sphere of its operation has ended because it's, it occupies a place within an unfolding storyline of history, as we thought. And in that sense, it was the way in which Israel, Israel related to God. And in that sense, the church, therefore, is not under law. It doesn't mean the law somehow irrelevant or lost its function. On the one hand, it's, it reveals sin. It re that's <coughs> Luther's great point. It's a way of a bar on, against which humanity and the people of God have fallen short. But it also, um, and this is very, very important, it gives a framework or a perspective on the shape of a, of a life to be lived, read through the lenses of the coming of Christ. And that's very, very striking in that regard. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse eight, the other side of judgment, the other side of Israel's failure, looks forward to a day when the heart of people are circumcised, and when the heart is circumcised, then they're going to do the law in a new kind of way. So it's got an ongoing durative force to it. Jesus does something wonderful with it, as does Paul. It's somehow embodied in him, and the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10 says that somehow he embodies this. So he picks up Deuteronomy chapter 30 in Romans 10 and says it applies to himself, the word of faith. But it's that same ongoing relevance. So obviously I teach preaching here at Liverpool and I'm often asked the question, you know, how do you preach from the law, uh, so books like Deuteronomy, so that it's neither purely sort of driving you to Christ that we just leap straight from Deuteronomy to Jesus, yet at the same time, not falling into a kind of legalistic, without a sense of the context in which we've given. I mean, how, how do you help students with that particular bit? So I think one thing is to, really important to recognise this story framework. It's to do with a place in history, in time. And it's not a timeless piece of work like that. So think of it with this story context. And therefore there's a sense which is not addressed to the church, but it's still all relevant. I came across an analogy which I've used and picked up in the book um, from <coughs> Oliver O'Donovan, who was professor uh, here in Oxford, a uh, professor of moral, moral theology, I think. Imagine a situation where you've got a police officer who shouts, stop thief. There are two real questions to think about there. Does this police officer have authority? Does she have the authority to say, stop thief, in the same way? Does Deuteronomy have authority? Yes, it does. It's God's word that he speaks. It has authority. There's a second question, which is a question of claim. Is the police officer talking to me? Well, if I'm the thief in view, well then yes, it's directly related to me. I should stop. But suppose I'm an onlooker or a bystander. Does it relate to me? Well, yes and no. Has it got a claim on me? Yes, it does. Uh, is there an authority to it? Yes, it has. But what does the claim mean for me? It's not identical, is it? It's In that context, it's something like either get out of the way or assist me in stopping the thief. 
But supposing that, that and it seems to me that's one way in which you could say, well, Deuteronomy is relevant to the world at large, the bystanders, people looking in. It's got a claim and an authority. It is a political, as well as a religious text. But supposing, the analogy something breaks down a bit, but you can get what I mean here. Supposing I'm in some senses also a thief. I'm not the thief that the police officer was speaking to, but I'm nonetheless a thief. The police officer has authority, stop thief, and a claim, not quite talking to me, but talking to the category of thieves, stop. I should stop what I'm doing. So the task of the church then is to recognize, yes, authority, yes, claim, but how does it connect to me through the lenses of Christ? And that's what I try to do a bit in the book. Mm. That's, that's a very helpful way of thinking about it, because sometimes, you know, in the, the desire to sort of neatly categorize what the function of the law is, that we can sort of make it a bit toothless, really, in terms of yeah. how it has a claim stood on our life yeah. today. No, that's right. So you tend to hear words like abrogated or put to one side or no longer relevant. And I'm very uncomfortable with that, given Jesus', Jesus words about it. And in many ways, Paul picks up and takes the moral demands of the <clears throat> law as self-evidently true. You know, loving the fulfilment of the law and so on. The Apostle Paul does in Romans 13. So I want to have that ongoing force and the authority, but thinking carefully so I'm, I don't simply drop it as if it was written to the 21st century mm. and just land it in this culture as if without thinking through Christ and his relevance. Just tell me a bit more about the title. So Honey from the Rock, you mentioned, is uh, almost a direct quote. It is a direct Jim quotation. Crowley. It is a direct quotation. So um, just unpack it for me a little bit. Well, I chose it as a title. It was <coughs> with great help of a former colleague here, Peter Walker. We both came up with this idea going for a walk in the university parks. Um, and it made great sense. Honey, because it's about sweetness. Rock, because um, you might think... Deuteronomy not a very plausible place to find this sweetness, but in the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, where it comes from, this rock is precisely God. And in fact, you find in verse 4, the start of this um, Song of Moses, the rock stands resplendent. The Lord is described as the rock in this metaphor, standing resplendent. So it's not just an unlikely place to get sweet things, but the sweetness of God's word coming from the rock who is God himself. Mm -hmm. So that's rather great, it. Yeah, it's yeah. a great title, and it's uh, quite evocative. So, because both are very concrete mm. metaphors as well, aren't they? Okay. Well, th here's a slightly more complex question, but one that we can't completely evade, um, mm. which is really to do with um, the commands you find in Deuteronomy mm. to slaughter the Canaanites, and obviously this is something that causes a lot of popular chat, particularly amongst yeah. the new atheist movement. Sure. Um, but how how do you you help people answer questions like that in our sort of 21st century context? Well, um, this is, in a sense, for many, this is the deal breaker. In many ways, Deuteronomy is a very humanitarian document set against the ancient context and the culture of its day. And then you come to this apparent command that God seems to command the slaughtering of the Canaanites. And it seems to disqualify the book from any serious consideration whatsoever. There are many things that have been said and could be said, and I try and go through some of these in the book. Um, some, for example, say that it's really a metaphor for religious purity, and it's not actually ever meant to be literally carried out. And there's certainly a move towards that in my judgment in the book, particularly in chapter 7, where the command to show the Canaanites no mercy is then filled out in positively what they should do. It's all about dealing with religious symbolism and, it, and so on. But the thing I found most helpful in this regard is to recognize that Deuteronomy combines both a realism and an ideal. It's the realism of a culture, a point in time, in history, where God accommodates himself to the, uh, the <clears throat> form of warfare and to the situation of that point in time. But alongside that realism, there's an ideal that sets out, that's set out. The same for me, incidentally, about slavery and some aspects about um, how women are treated in Deuteronomy. Um, and the sense in which the ideal contains the seeds of its own destruction in terms of an, an ethic of love and the brotherhood of people that goes with it. And so it's part, it's part of God's storyline within 
beginning back in Genesis, of God's plan to bless the whole world. And it's a sense in God's reluctance. It's not God's ideal forever. One day God is going to shatter the spear. So it's an I it's the ideal is not warfare, the ideal is peace. But for a point in time, for a season, accommodating to a, a reluctant necessity, this was what was called. And there's a realism about that alongside that. Which is why it's not a mandate for people today to think that anything like that should be done that tragically has been taken on board yeah. through history. And Jesus of course makes that very clear when he says, put down the sword. But he's not innovating that. That's something which is already implicit for me in Deuteronomy. So, so those who've used it, you know, to justify the Crusades or whatever in the past, mm. well, you're you're suggesting that actually if they read it through the way in which Jesus interpreted Deuteronomy, they didn't have a mandate for doing that in Deuteronomy. So it's not just yes. Yeah, so it's both Jesus's interpretation of Deuteronomy, put down the sword, he tells Peter to put the sword down. Enough of that. But also within Deuteronomy itself, in the context of the Old Testament, it's not a mandate for an, a blueprint for all time. And in fact, of course, Israel didn't do that through history. So after the exile, when it came to um, the question of intermarriage, I mean, Ezra chapter 9, Deuteronomy 7 is quoted, but you don't find slaughter going on. You find a, a well, again, even this was a very challenging thing but it was not a, a literal carrying through of what was in view yeah that's so, very helpful yeah. thank you some of that's in here i presume yes it is <laughs> exactly yes. so not a good plug for the book yeah you might find a little bit more help on on that um my technology is breaking down so there may be a few questions coming in which we're happy to um attempt um but just while i'm i'm looking those up um just to say that we're hoping that these Broadcasts will become a sort of monthly um, thing, and please keep watching the website for more details about the next one. I mean, over the next few months, I'm hoping that we will talk a little bit more about the School of Preaching, which is coming up 10th to 14th of June. Um, and this year, we're actually going to be taking um, uh, a Wycliffe alum and a former Bishop of Durham, um, Tom Wright, uh, has written a book called How God Became King. and this book is really thinking about the challenge of how you preach the gospel actually from the gospels themselves um, and that will be the theme of our school of preaching um, and uh, my other colleague Dr Justin Harden will come and have a chat with me about, about that book and then I'm hoping also that we'll have Dr Michael Lloyd the incoming um, principal um, to chat in the future as well so before then um, let me just um, <laughs> take cover all the best laid plans uh, a few questions that uh, are tricking in, uh, James, which I will read out and then just get you to answer, I think, is the, okay. the easiest way to handle this, yeah. um, well, rather, well, rather than me read them out and answer them. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so... Um, question here is... Um, I form the light and create darkness, I make peace and create evil, I the Lord do all these things. The question is, does God create evil? I think that's a great question. Isaiah 45 7? I think it is Isaiah 45 I think it's Isaiah 45 7. If you go back in the ancient world where you have deities for everything, the real danger is polytheism. So what you're trying to do at that point in time in history, it seems to me, is uh, if, if your God is to say, look, there's one God who's responsible for everything, in the sense that um, there aren't equal and opposite powers at work, a kind of dualistic view of the world. And so you don't find the Satan or the accuser or the devil highlighted particularly at all. You find God standing behind, in a certain sense, all that happens. <clears throat> But what you begin to find, especially as there's clear monotheism, God is one God coming to the fore, it seems to me then the danger is, well, is God then responsible for evil? The word evil, of course, can be both moral and unpleasant things. And it seems to me as that becomes the danger, you begin to see actually, no, God doesn't stand behind this in the same way as he stands behind good. So, to, so there's a sense in which is answering slightly different questions. And that's the way it makes sense. So you then find the New Testament, you find much more 
the devil coming to the fore when you clear there is one God in Israel and then you say actually no he doesn't stand behind evil in the same way as he stands behind what is good but it doesn't happen outside of his sovereign purposes. I think ultimately that, that point about dualism is really important because you know there aren't two equal and opposite no, forces competing exactly. in the world and that's the worldview that the New Testament with the whole Bible rejects yeah. um, and therefore if we do acknowledge and believe God is absolutely sovereign yeah. then you have to explain evil under God's yeah. sovereignty. Yeah. I mean John Piper's quite provocatively written about that recently hasn't he in, in his, his battle with cancer and, and, yeah. and I mean he, he talks about cancer as being a gift for God for him because of how God used it in order to produce God in his life. Quite a provocative way of saying it, but ultimately if you believe in a God who's sovereign, then he's actually sovereign over evil as well as over good. Yeah, that's a very, very different <clears throat> one. I think. The book of Job for me and other lament psalms legitimates a response of, Lord, what are you up to? And I'm not sure it'll be everyone's call to say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, or thank you for this. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, ultimately, um, God has put in place a plan yeah. through Deuteronomy on yeah. the coming of the Lord Jesus that deals with evil and, and ultimately yeah. looking forward to eradication. Tricky stuff, um, but um, New Testament is quite consistent really in, in uh, encouraging us to believe a God who's sovereign over all, working out his ultimate purposes. Yes. So, can I just maybe move on to one last question really, but it does flow out more generally out of your Deuteronomy writings, which is um, how God's dealings with Israel can now help us make sense of how God is ongoingly still relating to his world. It's quite a big question that I realise. Yeah. Uh, yes, so it seems to me that there are certain, um, what would you say, um, key pivotal moments in the Old Testament which need to be understood. Of course you've got creation at the beginning when God blesses humanity and creates humanity and gives humanity a task to look after his world and you find that falling apart and messing up and then God chooses a wandering nomad, Abraham in Genesis 12 and says I want you to be the vehicle through whom God's you know, my plans for the whole world and the remaking of the world are carried forward. And so in and through Abraham and then in and through Israel, that comes true. So you find in Deuteronomy chapter 1, you find mention of the promises made to Abraham. So there's somehow God's promises are being carried forward through the particular, but they have a universal reference. And that seems to be the key. And you come through the rest of the Old Testament, and you see that in the person of Jesus, um, he is the climax of all Israel should have been. And at the climax of all Israel should have been, he is the one, in a sense, through whom God's purposes for humanity come to the fore and come to pass. And so um, that's how it is possible that a Jew in first century Palestine can have global significance. The particular, the individual, can always have global significance. That's always been God's plan. Israel is part of that. Right. So again, uh, mushrooming out in a sense to, mm. to what you see in a smaller setting, God dealing with Israel and Deuteronomy actually then becomes part of that main paradigm yeah. for God's dealing with the whole of the world. Yes, it's a, little, it's a picture in miniature almost of his relation with the whole world. And so you find the whole question of Israel in the land is echoes back to Adam and Eve in the garden and to the church <clears throat> in the new creation. Yeah, which is quite exciting. Really. Yes. Mm -hmm. but I, yeah, so we have a couple more questions, but as usual, technology is not completely behaving itself. So we're going to have to look here. Yeah, Peter Walker as well. Thank you very much for um, um, tuning in and for asking a few, question, uh, few questions. Um, so there's a question here about how can ministers um, uh, occasionally preach the Old Testament um, books better? So let, let's suppose you have, um, you know, just one, two, three weeks in a year in which you've got Deuteronomy. How would you... You know, what, where would you encourage preachers to go and what would you encourage them to sort of highlight as key themes and passages that might help them get to the heart of the book of Deuteronomy? I think there are maybe two or three questions there. So if I could just stick with Deuteronomy first of all, what is the, the, the thrust of Deuteronomy? Well, it seems to me that um, the main thrust comes from chapter 30 and it's the call that Moses gives to the people of God on the edge of the promised land to choose life. They're facing a choice. 
between the life, and life that's in view here is a life in obedience to God through his Torah, his instruction, his law, and the alternative is death, which is the death idolatry and rebellion and disobedience and so on. And so that, that seems to be at that point in time incredibly contemporary both for the church every day and um, for the outsider who's not yet convinced. Let me give you an example of that. Deuteronomy Focus is very much about how the past back at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb and the future of life in the land is compressed into this today in the plains of Moab. And the call today is to choose life. Psalm 95 picks up on this. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Jesus picks up it in, in Luke's Gospel. To deny yourself, take up your cross daily, as long as it's called today. And then in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, there's the same focus on today. So every day is a decision making day. Every day, like is a Moab day, is a today day, is a choice day, where you choose life, the life of obedience, or choose death. And Moses sets that before, and that's uh, exactly the same choice that we as Christians mm. face every day, mm. on the edge of the land, if I can put it right, I'm looking in. Yeah, no, that's really helpful, and I think um, you know, we can really resonate with that today, can't we? Mm. Today, choose life. Yeah. And um, we need to wrap this up at the moment, but I just want to acknowledge that um, Peter Walker's um, chimed in here to say, really glad that you chose that title. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Grateful to that. Um, and um, it's good to hear from you, Peter, on the, the other side of the pond, too. And I just want to thank you for, for logging in um, today and for those who, who watched this subsequently. Um, we're experimenting a little bit with this new format, trying to enter into modern technology, which is largely working. Um, and uh, thank you to all who've uh, set this up. And thank you, James, for, for coming Pleasure. on to chat. And I uh, hope that you'll be able to join us for next time. Watch this space as we continue to have um, theological conversations with our friends around the world. Thank you.